Como de costume, farei a introdução desta conversa tanto em português quanto em inglês, primeiro em inglês. This is a very important and interesting conversation that I did with Brent Johnson, CEO of Santiago Capital. He's also known for his dollar milkshake theory. We talked about many subjects, including the dollar hegemony, why it is the least bad option among all fiat currencies, We also address the current policy divergence where the Federal Reserve is raising rates and other central banks aren't, and what it means for investors and currencies around the globe. I hope you enjoy it and please share it. Essa é uma conversa muito importante e interessante que eu fiz com o Brent Johnson, que é CEO da Santiago Capital. Ele também é conhecido pela teoria milkshake do dólar. A gente falou sobre vários assuntos, incluindo a hegemonia do dólar, por que o dólar acaba sendo a menos pior de todas as moedas fiduciárias, e também abordamos a atual divergência de política monetária, onde o Fed está subindo juros e outros bancos centrais não estão. E o que isso significa para investidores e moedas ao redor do mundo todo. Espero que vocês gostem, compartilhem. As legendas serão publicadas logo depois deste vídeo, talvez um, dois dias depois. Então acompanhem aqui e ativem elas pelo próprio tocador aqui do YouTube. Então espero que gostem e fiquem agora com a conversa. So, Brent, thank you very much for coming on the show. Happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So there's so much going on in the financial markets lately, but uh, I, I want to start discussing the situation of the U.S. dollar. I understand there's so many dollar bears and a few people even prognosticating that the U.S. dollar standard is dead or the dollar is collapsing. Yeah. Is that the right assessment? Well, I certainly don't think so. I know that is kind of a fairly popular uh, opinion, or if it's not popular, it's no longer fringe. Like it's kind of in the everyday course of conversation now. So to hear talk about that is not quite as unusual as it used to be. Um, in kind of the circles I run in, it's it's, it's discussed more frequently, but it, it wouldn't surprise me to see this written in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the Financial Times. You know, with all that's gone on over the last, call it two or three years, and especially the last two or three months, um, that has really become kind of a, a zeitgeist issue. It's, it's it's a it's an issue of the times, I guess is the right way to say it. Yeah, and but the thing is, as I understand, if one was to say the dollar is collapsing, I mean, which other uh, fiat currency isn't collapsing, right? Well, that's that's kind of been my argument all along is, you know, I I'm the first to admit that the U.S. has many problems. Um, we have not done a good job of managing our fiscal house, for lack of a better word. We've made many mistakes. We've borrowed too much money. We've spent money we don't have. Whatever adjective or way you want to describe it, I would I would agree that we are guilty of it. Mm -hmm. The issue is that every other country is guilty of it as well. Um, I can't think of really any country that has done a very good job. You could argue that Russia has done a better job than most. Um, but the problem is Russia has other problems, you know, right. even though they've kind of managed their economy or at least their budget better than the West, they have many other issues that preclude them from being a reserve currency or a currency that a, that an investor would normally save their money or, or hold a reserve asset in. And, you know, that could potentially change someday, but we're certainly are not there today. Um, and I don't know of any other currency that that is either big enough or has the history or the trust um, that, that is required for a global reserve currency. And, and I know that many then will say, well, nobody trusts the U.S. anymore as well. And <laughs> I, will, I will admit there's some trust issues with the U.S. as well. But again, if you're one of the currencies has to get chosen or, or something is going to be the global reserve currency. And when you look around at the different choices, despite all the problems with the dollar, for many reasons, I think it will remain the global reserve currency for some time to come. Yeah. When you say no other currency is big enough, how can you qualify this big in what yeah. sense? Well, Think of it like this. So let, let's use the Swiss franc as an example, because the Swiss franc is held up very good against the dollar. A lot of times people will point towards its strength. But Switzerland is a small country. It's the size of a small U.S. state. Um, its economy is the size of an individual state. 
um, they have negative debt or the, they have negative interest rates. Yep. If the whole world decided that they were going to use the Swiss franc as the, as the global reserve currency, everybody rushing into the Swiss franc would make it uh, go up 10 times in value, which in one sense would be good for the citizens of Switzerland because they would have a strong currency. They could go purchase assets around the world, but their industries would immediately become uncompetitive and it would most likely throw them into a very uh, – I, not necessarily a recession, but but potentially because yep. everything would be thrown out of whack. In other words, it's just not a big enough market to absorb all the demand that goes along with a with a global reserve currency. Typically, global reserve currencies, and and I'm not saying this couldn't change or there couldn't be some new system, but typically, you know, a global reserve currency is a currency that has a big debt market, which you can park very large sums of capital in. And it just so happens that part of the reason that the U.S. is the global reserve currency is, is, is kind of threefold. Number one, we have the biggest economy and we have the biggest, we're the biggest customer of almost everybody. Either us or China are the two biggest customers for every other country. So they're getting revenues in dollars. So then they want to say they want to match their liabilities with their revenues so they don't have a currency exposure. Well, right. so then they save their money in dollars, and so they, they remove that currency fluctuation. Now, some some people will hold their current, you know, their reserves in another currency, but then you have to manage that currency exposure. Um, but then the other thing is that we also have the world's largest military, right? And we kind of enforce the use of the dollar as the global reserve currency. So we've kind of got the carrot and the stick, right? And on the one hand, we're, we're your biggest customer. You do business with us, we're going to buy a lot of your goods. You're going to get rich by selling your goods into the United States. And then you hold the currency that we pay you in as a reserve asset. And maybe you buy treasury bonds. And it's just the way the system works. Um, the flip side is if you decide you don't want to do business with the United States, but we still want to do business with you. I, I, I kind of hesitate to say this, but I think people would agree that we park an aircraft carrier off your coast. And we say, <laughs> hey, we, we would really, really, really like to do business with you. <laughs> and uh you know that's not necessarily the nice part of of, of global reserve currencies but it's a reality yeah um you know and if you look at the countries around if you just over just since i've been alive and over the last 40 years i'm actually 50 but let's say over the last 40 or 50 years the number of times uh, a country or a region tried to you know set up a reserve currency outside the dollar or trade their commodities and something other than the dollar or move their economy away from the dollar. You know, in, in many cases, those leaders are no longer there. And in many cases, the U.S. unfortunately sent in military operations yeah. to bring them back in line. And I, I, that is one of my least favorite parts of this conversation, but I think it's an actual real part of the conversation that, you know, when it really comes down to it, it it's true. Um, so that, that, that I just don't see anybody else coming along and replacing that right now. Now, history says two things. One is all empires fall. And then as soon as that one falls, another one takes its place, right? Um, but empires are never willingly given away. No, Nobody ever, well, or very, very rarely, I, you should never say never, but very rarely does somebody give away power that they have. And I, and I just don't think that any country is going to give away the power of the global reserve currency. It, it has to be taken from them. And again, that kind of leads to some of the other things that are going on in the world right now. But, you know, it typically leads to a military conflict when global yep. reserve currency is taken for, for, from one to the other. So, you know, I, I heard somebody mention this the other day. We're kind of at, an, at a hinge in history. And, and I think that that's actually really correct. I think there's a lot of historical things going on right now. They have been for the last couple of years. I think they will continue for the next couple of years. I think 15, 20 years when we look back at this time period, we will have seen an, an, an inflection point of some kind. Now, whether that's militarily or, or economically or socially or maybe all three of them together, um, I'm not sure. But I just feel like uh, we're, we're, at an, we're at a place where all the stuff is up in the air and it can go really, really go any way. But. If I was looking down on the board, if this was a board game and I was looking down from above, I just don't see anybody else that's going to knock off the United States right now. Um, I can be wrong, but that's just how I see it. I have the same 
the same view. I, I think I'm pretty on board with you on the, on the the standing of the U.S. dollar, the, its dominance, and w another aspect which I find is very important for a money to be the reserve currency of the world. Besides having a large debt market, a large uh, capital market, a stock market as well, the legal security as well. Yes. When you look at right. the other, the, the alternatives, even the euro, I mean, it's it's incomparable. Even it's not. Yeah. It, it does not mean that you ignore the problems with the U.S., but it's just right. the alternatives are actually worse. Right, and I and I think, and it, it's not exclusively this way, but but I would be willing to bet that the large majority of dollar bears, for lack of a better word, or or people that think the U.S. is going to lose its reserve currency status are located in the, ironically, I think they're located in the United States as opposed to outside the United States. Um, most people I talk to outside the United States say, oh yeah, you, you, you think you think the dollar's bad, you should have our currency. You know, and they, 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 <laughs> instantly know, they, they instantly know the dollar exchange rate. In other words, you know, I, I went, uh, I'll never forget, I, I went on my honeymoon in Brazil, uh, 20, almost 20 years ago, not quite, but pretty close. And I remember going to the beach in Rio and there was a gentleman there and he would run and get me drinks and get me a chair and, and he asked to get paid in dollars. I had reals, he asked me to pay him in dollars. Um, and I think that probably still goes on. Um, I think yeah. it happens in Sao Paulo and I think it happens in Mexico City and I think it happens in Moscow and Tehran and Cairo and London. I think you can pay with dollars just about anywhere. Um, you know, I think if you show up on the beaches in South Africa and try to pay in Australian dollars, they probably look at you pretty weird, right? But if you said, I have U.S. dollars, they'd probably take them. Um, now, it's not like that everywhere, but it's like that with the U.S. dollar more than any other currency. Um, yep. and, and it's funny, I travel a lot. I, I, I've been fortunate enough to be, you know, all over the world in different places, you know, some big cities, some rural places. And I always just kind of make it, I, just because I find it interesting, I always ask them about the local economy, the local currency. And, and then I always ask them about the dollar and I ask them about gold. I, I just ask, and it, it, it's, you know, inevitably they, they know a lot about the dollar. They don't necessarily know a lot about other fiat currencies, but they seem to know a lot about the dollar. Um, and so I, I just, you know, I, I think that that's an important uh, thing to consider. I have the I've had the same experience, especially in Eastern Europe, in Latvia and uh, Lithuania and Estonia. I asked some locals regarding the how how did they invest and protect their savings back in yeah. the 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 Soviet times? And I asked, did you buy gold or hard gold? And then no, it's dollars. Always dollars. Yeah. Always has been. <laughs> It's no other currency. Well, and I think, and, and I, th I think the, the point you're making is a good one, and, and it really goes back to my argument. Is it, it's not an argument that the dollar is a good currency. If if I had to get up and argue the reasons that the dollar is a horrible currency, I think I could probably win that debate. Just because, but <laughs> but, but what are you going to argue against? You know, and that's and you know, while the U.S. is not necessarily hard money, it's not backed by a physical thing. You know, compared to many other currencies, it's considered a hard currency, right? Um, and again, if you, it's, I don't know if you guys do it the same way in Brazil, but when I was growing up, if you were going to play a game of basketball, maybe you do this with soccer or football, you know, you line everybody up and then you start making picks, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, you pick this guy and you pick that guy and this girl and that girl. And, you know, eventually you, everybody's picked, but somebody gets picked first. And so even if all the players are horrible, you know, even if they, they don't know any idea what the game is, how to play it, how to kick a ball, what a net is, you're still going to pick somebody first. Somebody is still going to be the number one pick, as bad as they are. And I think that's kind of the, the way to think about the dollar. Is it, it's, it's a horrible, horrible player, but it's still the best out of the choices. <laughs> <laughs> what role do you think that the the fact that the dollar is no longer backed by gold what yeah. role does it play in the in the in this transition from uh, yeah. from the dollar from to another reserve currency because if yeah. we analyze history the previous reserve currencies 
the sterling pounds, the Dutch guilder, they were all backed by gold or silver. So the, the yeah. money proper was the commodity, not the paper. Now it's different. We no longer have this backing. It, it seems to me that it's it's even more difficult now to get rid of the dollar standard. Yeah, so I think the, I, I, part of the reason I think this is so interesting is, is I, I don't disagree with what you just said. Uh, the last couple global reserve currencies, including the U.S. dollar, at least for a time, yep. had gold as, as either partial or full backing. And I think throughout history, there's many times that gold or some other hard commodity was money. But there was often many times throughout history where money was just whatever the king or the governor or the local warlord said it was. Um, and you can actually, and you know, there's this theory that money developed out of barter. You know, if you had a cow and you needed a pair of shoes, you had to walk around with your cow until you found a shoemaker and you'd give him a cow and he'd give you 10 pair of shoes or, or whatever it is. And I'm sure that that type of barter economy happened a little bit and at certain times, but there's actually very, very little, little historical evidence that that ever happened. But there's actually a lot of evidence that says this king or that governor or that so-and-so demanded X amount of wheat or X amount of corn or whatever it was at the end of the season. And so everybody knew that you had to pay your taxes and that thing, whatever that thing was. And so then that kind of became money that everybody exchanged because everybody knew they needed that because they had to pay the king or the governor at the end of the end of the tax season. And that and so there's an argument that that's that's how money developed was what was the most commonly used good in order to satisfy the king. And so I think there's a little bit of recency bias with gold being money. Now, having yeah. said that, I actually think if the free market were to choose what would become money, I think the free market would choose gold. I actually think it's the best form of money for several reasons, or it's the best thing to back a token that would be used as money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for several reasons, I don't know if we have time to go into all of them now, but but yep. just, be, just because it's the best form of money doesn't mean it's going to be the chosen form of money, right? I mean, you, you, could, argue, you could argue that democracy is the best form of government. Now, whether it is or not, I think that's open for debate, but you could make that argument. But just because democracy, just because democracy is the best form of government, you look around the world, there's a lot of places that are not democracies. So just because something should be some way doesn't mean it's going to be that way. Right. And I think that for many reasons, mainly because they don't like to have handcuffs put on them, but governments don't like gold as money because it makes them be fiscally conservative. It makes them keep their promises. It makes them. You know, it makes it harder for them to spend money and, you know, get votes, basically. Um, and to a certain extent, it's hard to, to have a growing economy with, with gold. It, it, you could argue that there's a uh, it, it makes the expansion of the money supply less. So the mm -hmm. rate of growth slows down. Now, the good thing about that is it keeps inflation in check. The bad thing is, is it potentially also keeps growth in check. So. Anyway, there's, there's a number of pros and cons. I happen to think that the pros on gold outweigh the cons. And what, and I think from a citizen's point of view, that gold would be a great asset to have back in currency. If I was a government and I, and I wanted to have flexibility, I probably wouldn't choose that. And I think that's why they don't. And so I think the reason that central banks around the world and governments around the world hold gold and why dictators hold gold is they know that sometimes people don't listen to them or people lose, lose confidence in them. And at some point, the markets, the free markets overpower whatever diktats the, the government have said. And I think in many ways, governments hold gold for the same reason that you and I and other people do. It's kind yeah. of as an insurance policy. Because you know if, if, if the system we design collapses, gold will put itself forward as a worthy uh, replacement, right? And so when I have this comment about the dollar being the best currency, often people will say, well, gold is better than the dollar. Again, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I disagree that the governments are just going to stand back and let it happen. They may be forced to do it in order to regain confidence or, or whatever it is or as a last ditch effort. 
um, you know, to, to underpin the failing economy, but I don't think that they want to do it. Yeah. So, anyway. And I kind of got off on a long tangent there. I apologize. No, but I think it's it's an it's an important and fascinating discussion, and and it's difficult difficult to understand uh, uh, how the, how the monetary order will unfold. But I think my my kind of doubt is the lack of a gold standard or not being backed by gold makes it more difficult to switch reserve currencies, as in the past. Well, yeah. it's just the paper. Yeah. Uh, Fair enough. Exactly. Yes, that, that's actually a good point. And, that, and that's kind of one of when, again, I personally am a huge advocate for gold. I think everybody should own gold. I think gold is going to go up a lot in the years ahead. Um, but I don't necessarily think we're going to go back to a gold standard. And if we do go yeah. back to a gold standard, I, I think it will be as a last ditch, final effort, you know, la last resort. Um, and so I, I, I think... I think a lot of people who are advocating for it, I understand their advocation. I understand why they think it's going to be that way or why that would be better. But just because we think that it will be better, there's a lot of people who think that it wouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so th I think there would be a lot of pushback uh, were that to come along. But along those lines, not only would, would there be individuals who don't understand gold and who push back, but you know, the, the governments around, and it's not just the U.S. The U.S. has definitely done it, but it's not just the U.S. You know, governments around the world for the last 50 years have tried to demonetize gold. In other words, like you said, get it out of the system. Like mm -hmm. it's in papers. It's in kind of, you know, the first thing, the first, whenever somebody, you know, mentions gold, you know, like you get the eye roll, right? Oh, God, he's a gold bug, <laughs> right? People it's who true. favor gold have been negatively maligned and pigeonholed into a certain type of crazy person, right? Oh, he's one of those gold guys, right? B and so, barbaric. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think that's by design. It's really yeah. by design because they want to they want to squash the conversation as much as possible. Not only that, but they've passed rules and regulations to kind of get gold out of the monetary system. Now, there's some. You know, they, they, you know, you look at the Basel three, there's some things in there where where gold has been elevated back to a tier one asset. But, but they've spent so much time and energy trying to get gold out of the system. I think it would be really weird. And the last thing they'd want to do is just automatically bring it back in, because if they bring it back in, all that that work that they've done to get it out of the system is now gone. True. Right. And so they would. So if they wanted to go off of gold standard again, they'd have to start all over again. So. Um, anyway, I, I think I think I think I understand the arguments for for wanting gold. Um, I think it's possible. I, I think it's unlikely. And uh, switching gears now to the very current monetary uh, affairs, we are witnessing a policy divergence. So the Federal Reserve yes. is raising rates. The ECB is keeping them at negative minus. I think it's zero. 0 0.5, if I'm not, or 0 0.4, the same with the Bank of Japan. But we might be seeing the milkshake theory unfolding right now. It's, 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 it's yeah. ongoing at this very <laughs> moment. The yen just jumped 7% in less than two weeks. I mean, this yeah. is almost unheard of. So, yeah. uh, how do you see this? Especially playing out for a today? currency, especially for a currency like the yen. Yeah. You know, that, that's another one that many people would tell me. You know, the win, the yen could be the reserve currency, and you know, it's it, it's probably the biggest one out there, other than the U.S. But it's still, it's just not on the level of the U.S. And the, the the yen is a very good example that we can use to point to explain my theory, and and I'll explain what my theory has been just really quickly okay. for people who maybe haven't heard it the first time, and that is that my thesis has been that despite all the problems with the dollar for several reasons that we've kind of discussed today, it's still the best out of the fiat currencies. And despite the fact that we have quote unquote printed a lot of money, so has everybody else. Brazil did it, Argentina did it, Europe did it, Japan did it, Australia did it, Canada did it, you know. So it wasn't just the United States, the whole world was flooded with liquidity. And my argument has been that for several reasons, the US has the straw 
and whether that's interest rates that are higher than the rest of the world, to your point, this divergence of policy, the U.S. is raising interest rates. Japan still has negative rates. Switzerland still has negative rates. Parts of Europe have negative. Other countries are really low. Brazil actually has fairly high rates, but that, that's another story. Um, True. But, but for all these reasons, I think that capital will get sucked up into the dollar that's been – that's all this liquid that's been – generated will get sucked up like a milkshake into the dollar and then that creates the dollar to go higher which puts even more pressure on the rest of the world who has to fund themselves in dollars because dollars the global reserve currency and so my argument has been that even if we have to print money the rest of the world will have to print even more and so therefore the dollar will still rise and you know a year ago Nobody thought the Federal Reserve would ever stop doing QE or printing money. They didn't think that the government would ever stop sending checks to individuals. It was just almost a given that interest rates would stay at zero and that checks would keep coming. I mean, it, it, was, almost a, it was almost as a certain thing as I've ever come across in, in my career, or at least in the popular opinion. Yep. Now, to, now today... They've actually raised interest rates. Now, only 25 bips, but they did raise them, right? And today, the checks are no longer going out, at least not the COVID checks are no longer going. There's still a lot of, there's still a lot of charity that goes out and then assistance, but, but the COVID checks that everybody thought would never end have ended. So we've got this policy divergence again where the U.S. is tightening monetary policy, but the rest of the world, or at least much of the rest of the world, is still having loose policy. And so Bank of Japan has has come out and said that they will buy however many bonds they have to buy to keep interest rates pegged at 0.25%. And so this is a good example of the rest of the world having to do it even more than the United States. And so you've seen the yen, like you just said, fall dramatically. And I don't know if you've seen this chart, uh, but I have this long-term chart. It's a 40-year chart of the yen. It goes back to the early 80s. And I don't know if you know people listening believe in technical analysis or not, but it basically just shows a long-term trend and it shows a long-term support line. And for 40 years, this line has held its support. It would go up, it would come down, it would touch yeah. it, go up again, come down and touch it, and it would always bounce off this line. Well, in technical analysis, as long as it keeps bouncing on that line and going higher, then you say that the trend is intact, the trend is intact, it's going higher. But the problem is, is once that breaks and it's the, the, the longer the support is, the stronger the support is. But when that support breaks, it's almost like the foundation of the house giving out. And so that support, that 40 year support has now been broken and not broken by a little bit. Fairly, It's been broken fairly significantly for, and the, so, yen. for the yen. And there's a there's a lot of room down below for it to, now that it's broke. Think of like you living in a tree house and the floor goes out. When the floor goes out, you don't just fall two feet. Maybe you fall two feet and you grab on and you hang on to the to one of the floorboards and you're hanging, but the ground is still 20 feet down below. And that, that's kind of the yin right now. It's broken through support, it's hanging around, but there's a lot of room down below that it can fall now that the floor's given out. So it's gonna get really, really interesting. Um, and and the know, bank of the how things go from here. Bank of Japan is cornered because they have they want to defend the 10 year JGB yield cap, right? And they also want to defend the, the exchange rates. I mean, something's yeah. gotta give. Okay, so you've just touched on something else that uh, I kind of had this big long Twitter debate this weekend with a couple different people, and you know, the arguments they were making again, they're very good arguments. I, I don't really disagree with their arguments, they were saying that the US is going to have to go back to printing money and support and they're going to have to bail out the U.S. Treasury and they're going to have to choose. Do you do you bail out the dollar or do you bail out the bond? Right. You can't do both. And, and my point to them was in the very short term, they don't have to do both because the global reserve status of the dollar puts a bid under it. In other words, the rest of the world still needs dollars, even though they might not like them. They have to have them. And so that's who is bailing out the dollar while they can choose to bail out the bond, so to speak. 
Um, so it's interesting so to the see. Fed bails out the dollar, and the whole the whole world bails out the bond market. Or or the or the other way around. But my, my point is, is the Fed, the the Fed will ultimately have to make a choice. But everybody else will have to make the choice before the Fed does. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it's not just a U.S. issue. It's a Brazil issue. It's an Argentina issue. It's a South Africa issue. It's a Russia issue. It's a China. Everybody has the same issue. And they use the the, it's our dollar, yeah. but it's your problem. No, exactly. And so it's really interesting to see this going on with, with Japan today because they have they have had to make a choice and they are choosing to save the bond market and the economy because if interest rates went too high because of all the debt, the economy would collapse. So they're choosing to save the bond market and the economy at the expense of the currency. And so, you know, I think that that is what's going to happen kind of all over the world in various stages. And it will eventually happen to the United States, but I think it will happen to the United States last. And while it's happening to everybody else, I think the dollar goes higher. And, you know, kind of reflexively, as the dollar goes higher, it creates this problem everywhere else. So it gets into this vicious cycle. And it's once that vicious cycle starts, I think it's very, very hard to stop. Interesting. I'm listening to your, to your answer and, and reflecting myself here. Well, uh, <laughs> well, the other thing I'll say, listen, I, I, I try to say this all the time, is that like, it's possible I'm wrong. I, I've been thinking about this for a long time. I certainly don't have it all figured out. But I, I've been thinking about this for, I feel like for 15 years, I've been going through this different kind of stuff. And now it's finally actually happening. And um, it, it, it's going to be a crazy time. I'm certainly not going to get it all right. But I guess my point, the point that I like to make is that if I'm even a little bit right and the dollar does continue to go higher, it causes problems for the whole world. It doesn't just cause problems for the United States. So going back to Japan. Like a week, or let's use a smaller country than Japan, because j j the, the Japanese currency moving around actually does kind of cause problems for the whole world. But if we use a smaller country, uh, I don't know, let's just use Peru, for, for lack of a better word, right? If their currency goes up or down, it doesn't really matter that much to the rest of the world. True. You know, a few businesses here and there and regional, it, they would be affected, but you're not going to probably not going to get a global crisis based on you know, the, the, the Peruvian, I'm not, is it Peruvian? The Peruvian soul. Soul. I always forget that I serve in the soul. The, the Peruvian soul is probably not going to cause a global financial crisis or a global currency crisis. But the U.S. dollar going up or down, that has the potential to cause all kinds of chaos because the whole world needs it, right? And the whole world uses it. So if it's moving around a lot, and especially if it's going up, the monetary system is not designed for the dollar to go up. And so if the dollar goes up, the whole, it's the whole world's problem. And that's kind of why when the U.S. raises rates, they're not just raising rates on the United States. They're kind of raising rates on the whole yeah. world. You know, if China yeah. raises rates, they're raising rates on China. If Europe raises rates, they're raising rates on Europe. Same with Brazil, same with Australia. But if the U.S. raises rates, they're raising rates on the whole world because the whole world uses dollars. And so if you get into a country like Hong Kong or China, whose economies are slowing down and has deflationary pressures due to their real estate markets and all the debt that goes along with them, now that's a region that needs to have easier monetary policy. But because their currencies are pegged to the dollar, their monetary policy is kind of pegged to the dollar as well. So even though they need to have easy money, they're getting tighter money because the U.S. is tightening monetary supply. So it's yep. it's it's a it's a really it's a really interconnected world. It's becoming less interconnected. Um, you know, we're kind of going to regionalization and you know separate supply chains and you know currency blocks and economic blocks as opposed to just one big global market. Um, but that's causing a lot of chaos. And, and, and as long as the dollar is still the global reserve currency, the dollar going higher kind of causes a lot of problems for everybody. And what about the petrodollar? We've now seen, yeah. I think it was past week, uh, Vladimir Putin saying, uh, 
trying to make countries pay for oil and gas from Russia in rubles. Let's see if he can make that happen. Yeah. But what do you think is the importance of the petrodollar nowadays? It might have been very important yeah. back in the 70s, but does yeah. it play the same role now or not? What do you think? Well, it does, but maybe for not the same reasons that it used to. Um, now, the first thing I'll say is because it's been in the news, you know, it's been theorized for a while. Um, a couple different people out there, you know, Lou Groman has talked a lot about it. Uh, John Butler, a friend of mine, has talked a lot about it. Jim Rickards, who has written books, has talked about, uh, you know, Russia could use their you know, natural resources in some kind of uh, economic warfare. Um, it's not that I disagree that they can use them. They can certainly use them, and it's certainly tools that Russia has. The, the problem is, is now they're not using them in a proactive way in order to say, hey, come join us. We think the dollar is bad. Um, we think there's a better system. You know, we're going to use our natural resources to back our currency, and it will give you more, you know, belief in our currency and we want you to invest in it. If, if he had come out a year ago and done something like that, that's a little different than doing it the way he's doing it now. Now he's doing yeah. it as a react, as kind of a, I would argue, and I know people will disagree with me, but it's kind of an act of desperation. You know, yeah. he, he, he didn't say, hey, come use our currency and we'll back it with gold and it will be a great economic achievement. What he did was he invaded another country. He didn't think the rest of the world would sanction him. A big part of the rest of the world did sanction him. His currency fell 50%. And so then now he has said, okay, if you want to buy my energy or my natural resources, you either have to pay me in rubles or maybe pay me in gold, right? And so he's. it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I don't think he wants to use gold, but in an emergency, he knows he can use it. And I think he has an emergency on his hand, right? His economy is in a tailspin. His stock market is down, you know, 30, 40, or actually 50, 60 yep. percent, and it's large, no largely closed. His currency was down 50 percent. It's now rallied 30 percent, so it's down 20 percent. Um, but a large part of the world is no longer trading with him. They might trade with him, but they right now they're not. And so, you know. The, but but the point is, is that there's always a way around the dollar. You know, black markets have always, for, for, for as long as history has been around, there's always black markets where you can do transactions that kind of fly under the radar, the official way of doing things, right? In any world, in any country you go to, you know, like it's kind of like the dollar exchange rate is probably different on the streets of Rio than it is, you know, if you walk into a bank, right? That's the black market versus the real market or the, or the public market. Um, and so the, it's not that there's not ways that, you know, Putin can use his gold or his oil, but it's not as efficient. It's not as easy. And, 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 and it's not as productive as, you know, using uh, the current the, the current system as it's designed. So that, 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 that that's why that's where I think Putin's at right now. Um, but now let's go. I know I'm kind of jumping around, but this is it's, 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 it's a very big and a very important topic. True. He Putin does recognize that Russia and many other countries are kind of slaves to the dollar system. And, and I will agree that, you know, any other country or currency is a slave to the global reserve currency. And it just so happens to be the United States. And, you know, like we said earlier, nobody wants to give up that power. And so it's really, really hard to break away. It's not impossible to break away, but it's really, really, really hard to break away. Um, and so I think what Putin, but Putin recognizes that for the long term interest of Russia, he wants to try to get out from underneath the dollar, you know, shackles. And I think China would love to do it. I think large parts of the world would love to do it, but it's just really hard. And maybe it's just that Putin thought he had a better chance of succeeding um, than, than most others. And I think that's what he's trying to do. So he's trying to upset the petrodollar. Now, the petrodollar, it kind of goes back to the 70s when the U.S., because Saudi Arabia had the biggest oil reserves, and they struck a deal where the U.S. went to the Saudi Arabian, uh, the, the, the kingdom of Saud, the house, of, the house of Saud was the head of South, Saudi Arabia, 
and said, this is, this is the deal. And they kind of went with the carrot and stick again, right? We'll, we will give you lots of money. We will help you develop. We will bring you out of the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages and to become a, a vibrant, you know, current, uh, you know, high-tech economy. And in exchange, you will, and not only that, but we will protect you. We'll provide you military protection. We'll keep you and your family in power. And in exchange, you are going to sell your oil only in dollars. And when you get those dollars, you're going to turn around and buy treasury bonds. And so, you know, the House of Saud, that sounds like a pretty good deal. And so that's why, and that's largely why, you know, since oil is the lifeblood of the world economy, that's a big underpinning of the dollar as the global reserve currency. Okay, so now let's fast forward. Many countries would like to get out from underneath this. They would like to be able to use their own currency to buy dollars. Maybe even Saudi Arabia is kind of getting tired of the relationship. You know, they don't really want to only sell in dollars. The problem is, is, you know, who's going to protect them if the U.S. doesn't? So that's one of their concerns. And then the, the other big concern that most people don't realize is not just the petrodollar itself, but the petrodollar debt. So what do I mean by that? So. It's actually more euro dollar debt than petrodollar debt, but petrodollars and euro dollars are really kind of similar. So euro dollars is basically dollars that exist outside the United States. So mm -hmm. if you have a bank account in, um, are you in Porto Alegre? Is that where you said you are? Right. Right. So if you, if, if, you, if, if you have a dollar account in Porto Alegre, those are euro dollars, you know, and if you, if you build a building, in Brazil, and the bank gives you a loan in dollars to do it, I don't know if they do or not, but if they did that, that would be considered a euro dollar loan. But the point is, is around the world, large, large loans have been taken out in dollars um, by entities outside the United States. So everybody knows about all the debt that the US owes inside the United States. There's just as much debt owed outside the United States by non-US entities as there is inside the United States. And that's called Euro dollar debt. And so that's a big portion of the demand for dollars. Like people need dollars to service this debt and they need dollars to pay off the principal of that debt. And the Euro dollar is a big portion of the global funding currency for trade, um, True. Global, global, whether it's global trade or, or funding global trade or funding global governments or whatever it is. The, the biggest currency market in the world is the euro dollar market. It's just it's just the way it is. It's been that way for a long time. It's it's the biggest market nobody's ever heard of. Um, so, would you say the the euro dollar market is uh, now it's a more important pillar for the reserve currency than it was yes. in the seventies? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and here's part of the reason is because of all the euro dollar debt. There's all this demand for dollars. And so it keeps a bid under the dollar when there might not be a bid for the yen or the euro or whatever, right? So it kind of keeps the dollar strong versus other currencies. But the other part that happens is that, this is where it gets a little tricky, but this is a very, very key part of this, is because it's so much, it, it creates so much demand for the dollar, then people will say yes, but if they stop using dollars to sell oil, and if they stop using dollars to do trade, then they don't have to use the dollar anymore. And so then I say, okay, but what are they gonna do about their dollar loans? And they say, well, they'll just walk away from them, they'll default on them, and then that'll hurt the US. But here's the thing, that scenario does not hurt the US. That scenario hurts another entity that's outside the United States that loaned those dollars. So in other words, you know, in Turkey, Turkey owes a lot of money in dollars to European banks. So if Turkey decides they're no longer going to use the dollar and they're going to default on their US dollar loans, they're not defaulting on the United States. They're defaulting on the, the Spanish bank and the Greek bank and the Italian bank that lent them the money. And when those defaults start happening, you get a credit contraction. And once a credit contraction starts, then it starts a, a contagion. And that's what that's like what we had in March 2020. In March 2020, there was a contagion and nobody wanted to extend credit. So everybody was searching for the few dollars that existed. 
and nobody would loan money and the defaults started happening and you get and all the money gets sucked up into the dollar and the dollar goes higher and the other currencies go lower. That is exactly and, and that's exactly what we saw in March 2020. So the problem with the problem with going away from the petrodollar is if countries stopped trading oil in dollars, then there's going to be less dollars circulating, right? But all that dollar debt that exists is still going to be there. So it's going to be even harder to service the dollar debt if there's less dollars flowing around. Yep. And if they start defaulting on that dollar debt, you start defaulting on other countries, not the United States, and you get a credit contraction where there's even less dollars and funding becomes even harder to get. And so it's it's really a really a mess. <laughs> it's <laughs> the best way to say it. And there's really no there's really no easy way out of it. If there was an easy way out of it, it would have been done a long time ago. And so, you know, we're kind of stuck with it. And that, that's part of the reason why the dollar, why the dollar standard yeah. has lasted so long. It's and it's, this is also why it usually takes some kind of a military conflict for something like this to change because the pain is so bad to change it willingly. It usually has to get changed unwillingly. Yeah, and, and regarding the trade in other currency uh, instead of the U.S. dollar, I've seen some uh, reports saying, well, the, maybe Russia and China and Saudi Arabia, they will try to have contracts denominated in another currency or mm -hmm. price oil in another currency. I don't think that can happen at all. They might pay for oil in another currency, but oil will be priced in dollar because it is the unit of the account of the whole world. Right. It doesn't matter right. if they don't want to use it, the whole world is using it. Yeah, I mean you can transact in another currency, but it's gonna it's 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 gonna it's gonna settle, you know, or it's yeah. or it's gonna be priced off of the dollar. Yeah. So I'm not saying it can never change, but what, what I'm convinced of is it can't change without a lot of pain. Yeah. And and the, a lot of pain, in my opinion, means the dollar goes higher. And when the dollar goes higher, that creates problems all over the world. And it becomes this, again, this vicious cycle. And so, you know, I, I think that uh, the next few years are going to be extremely volatile for everybody involved. And, and, and for anybody who's heard me talk about, again, my milkshake theory again, I, I've said that the U.S. will fare better than the rest of the world. But, but I want to clarify that that doesn't mean that things are going to be good for the U.S. It doesn't mean that we're not going to get hurt. It doesn't mean that we're not going to feel a lot of pain. I just happen to think on a relative basis that we are set up to be okay better than most other places. And how do you anticipate this pain will manifest itself in the U.S.? Well, I think, uh, you know, we're going to have, uh, we're already seeing the inflationary pressures, right? Uh, you know, the, but I think, I think we're going to have stagflationary pressures. Some countries, some businesses are going to slow down. Um, Others are going to have their input costs rise. So either way, they're going to their profits are going to get squeezed mm -hmm. um, with interest rates low. Um, you know, it'll be harder to finance either real estate or, or projects. So maybe the growth slows as well. But again, I think this will be I think this will be happening all over the world. And I think on the relative, I think what little growth there is going to be in the world, I think it's going to be mainly in the United States. Yep. Yeah. And uh, what did you think of the uh, freezing of the same, of the forex reserves of the yeah. international reserves? Did you anticipate this could happen? Do you think this somehow is a an inflection point for the dollar standard, or not so much? Well, so this is another. This, it's funny. All of these issues have two sides to them. So yep. the first thing I'll say is that I wasn't totally shocked by it. I was a little surprised that they confiscated the reserves. Mm -hmm. Not shocked. I knew it could happen, but I was a little surprised that it did. I, kicking them out of SWIFT did not surprise me at all. Um, me but the, the, the confiscation of the reserves, again, it didn't shock me. And part of the reason it didn't shock me is I've thought about, I've thought about this a lot as it relates to gold. Um, but, you know, the fact that they not only um, – Kicked them out, but that they confiscated their reserves, their their actual currency reserves, sitting at other central banks. That was a pretty, that, that's a pretty big step. Um, and 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 I think people, I, I know I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but this is another important point. 
because it kind of goes back to what I was talking about military conflict is Russia is now under the most severe sanctions any country has ever endured, endured outside of wartime. Now, you could argue that with what's going on in Ukraine, it is wartime. Um, but, you know, in the 1930s and 40s, Japan had severe sanctions put on them and an oil embargo put on them. And they had extremely high input costs and inflationary costs in Japan. And that is part of the reason that that Japan attacked the United States in World War II. They felt like yep. they had to do it. What's happening to Russia now is more severe than what happened for Japan in the 1940s. And so it's, it's a very, very serious thing. And I think for people who think that Russia is just going to be easily able to brush these sanctions off and it is not going to hurt them, I think those people are being very naive. Now, I'm not saying that Putin doesn't have a few moves he can make. I'm not saying that they're helpless. And I'm not saying that he can't inflict pain on the West. I'm sure he can. But he is not in a good spot right now, right? Uh, he's just he's just not. And so from that perspective, um, I was a little surprised at how severe it got, how quickly. Now, does the confiscation of reserves mean the end of dollar hegemony is on the horizon? I would say potentially. I actually do think that it will be looked back on in history as a major turning point. But now that the ball is rolled, let's say that the ball is now rolling towards losing dollar hegemony or losing the dollar, you know, monetary standards. I don't think that that means the ball necessarily rolls downhill right away. So what I mean by that is let's go back to the playground analogy that we talked about earlier. You know, before yep. we were talking about picking teams. Well, now, again, there's let's say there's 10 people on the court. Even if they're all really nice people, one of them is the meanest out of all the nice people. So one of them, one of them is the alpha, right? Or one of them is the bully, however you want to discuss it, right? So this was a case of the bully walking over to the second or third biggest kid and taking all his lunch money, right? And... If all of the other nine kids ganged up on the bully, they could easily beat him up and take their money back. But that's usually not what happens, right? I mean, usually the other eight kids look around, they see that one kid laying on the ground with a bloody black eye and a bloody lip and his tooth knocked out. And they're like, oh, I don't want any, I don't, I don't want any part of that. So rather than go attack the bully, they, they go try to be his friend and try to get friendly with him. So I think there will be some of that um, where countries will not only not challenge the U.S., but will actually try to cozy up to the U.S. So I think there's part of that. But the other thing is that, you know, Russia is not some small little country in Africa or a very small regional country in Asia or some landlocked country in Europe. Russia is the biggest country in the world with one of the biggest, most sophisticated militaries, with natural resources, and a really, really smart leader. And I think there's probably other countries around saying, holy cow, I don't have anywhere near the resources that Russia does. And look what the rest of the world just did to Russia, right? I mean, they just put severe sanctions on Russia. And if they can do that to Russia, what can they do to me? Right. And so yep. I think so I think what so the point that I want to make is I think the ball is now rolling. I think we will look back on it as an inflection point, but I don't necessarily and I think countries around the world are going to start to think about contingency plans. What do we do? How do we get out from underneath this? How do we make sure this never happens to us? But I don't necessarily mean, think it means that they all turn on the United States right away. In fact, I think it could be the opposite in the short term. And then I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you another analogy. You know, I've used this analogy a few times in the last couple of weeks to kind of help make the point. is Because uh, I've had, since this has happened, I've had several people tell me, well, now that the U.S. has done this, nobody's going to hold dollars anymore. Nobody's going to want to hold treasuries anymore. Everybody knows that the, that the U.S. is the bully and they did a bad thing. And so it's game over for the, for the United States. So I, I understand that argument, but 
the the analogy I'll use is Twitter. I don't know, you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Yep. There's a lot of people on Twitter. Now, in the last couple of years, um, in many countries around the world, including the United States, you know, people who were speaking about things that the, I don't know, the government or the powers that be, however you want to define them, didn't like, they were banned or their accounts were shut down uh, or they were kicked out of that system and they weren't allowed to voice their opinion. And that's that's a bad thing, right? And you know, when these people got kicked off, they would go, there's, there's other messaging sites you can go to. There's other social media sites you can, and they would go set accounts up there and maybe a few people would follow them. But the fact is, is you and I are still on Twitter and most everybody else is still on Twitter. And even though I don't like the censorship and I don't like the banning and I wish they wouldn't have done it, it wasn't enough to get me to leave. And I think that's kind of like the dollar. I think there's probably a lot of countries out there who wish the U.S. wouldn't have done it, don't think that they should have done it. But are they really going to leave and go start transacting in gold or rubles just because they don't like what the U.S. did? I doubt it because then they're not going to be able to do business with the United States. And, and I, I think most countries will still choose to do business with the United States rather than to do business with Russia. Now, I don't know that for sure, but I think that that's probably the most likely scenario. I have two final questions. One very uh, quick. Do you have any expectation regarding the terminal rate in this tightening cycle by the Fed? <laughs> you know, I really, I really don't. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I think that the Fed will hike until they break the market. And whether they can hike one more time or 10 more times, I think it's probably lower. To, I think it's closer to two than it is the 10. Okay. But I really, I really don't know. I think it kind of depends on what happens in other countries and other regions. The world is so interconnected now; it's it's very hard to analyze one country in a bubble. Um, I think you have to look at the world as a whole. Uh, I think it's very possible that the U.S. would maybe be, have to stop doing what they're doing based on a crisis that's happening in another part of the world. You know, I, again, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I'm just convinced that whatever happens, it's going to be chaotic. And I'm convinced that when chaos reigns, the dollar goes higher. Now, it's not going to be in a straight line, but I, that's just kind of how I see it playing out. And so that's what I'm prepared for. And so in, in this macro environment, how should one, uh, how should the investor uh, position himself? Well, I think all investors, it, well, the first thing I'll say, it kind of depends who you are and where you're located and what currency you're denominated in. Right. I think what somebody in Brazil does is maybe be a little different than what somebody in Japan does or than somebody in the United States does. I think it's probably a little easier for people in the U.S. to hold cash because while inflation is high here, I think it's going to be much higher in other countries. And so while inflation may confiscate some of your purchasing power in dollars, I think it's going to confiscate even more purchasing power in other currencies. Um I, I have all my clients, we have we have cash, we have short-term fixed income, we have equities, we have gold, and then we have a number of very kind of asymmetric option style trades that would pay off if the dollar got really, really strong. Now, maybe those, maybe those little asymmetric trades will pay off and maybe they won't, but they're kind of an insurance policy against the greater portfolio. But if I was somebody who wasn't living in the United States or was managing you know, a portfolio uh, for someone in South America or Asia, I would very strongly consider not holding emerging market investments, but investing in the United yeah. States or, 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 or stocks in the United States or real estate in the United States, because I think the dollar will appreciate versus those currencies. And so if we get into some kind of a chaotic environment and there's not very much global growth and the dollar is rising versus another currency, let's pretend that you know, let's just use you as an example. And, you know, the, the Brazilian real has actually been very strong. I think on, it's, that's on the back of the fact you've been raising interest rates so far and commodity prices have been strong. And perhaps right. that will continue. But but if that doesn't continue for whatever reason, because of global growth slows or because there's a military conflict or, or whatever it is, um, or because gas prices go up, or maybe the grain prices go up, but because gas prices have gone up so much, you know, you're not making any money anyway. 
Um, you know, if I was someone like that, I would probably look to own U.S. equities. And I've used this example before, but I'll use it again because I think it displays it the best that I that I can think of a way to explain it. It's like, you know, the whole world knows Coca-Cola. I think people are going to drink Coke, whether we're in a, a recession, a depression or a boom, people are still going to drink Coca-Cola. People are still going to smoke Marlboro cigarettes. So I think if you owned Coca-Cola and Philip Morris and you own them in dollar terms, even if they didn't go up at all, let's say they stayed flat, they each pay a three, four, five percent dividend. And so if you're in Brazil and your currency goes down four percent and you get paid a four percent dividend, now you just made eight percent. Right. That's not that's not great, but it's not too bad. You know, the flip side is that if you if it goes down, let's say let's say Philip Morris goes down five percent. Well, if the currency goes down five percent, too, you've broken even. Right. And so you've, I think you've got a cushion there now. The flip side, the flip side is that the real gets stronger versus the dollar. Okay, that's possible. But if that's possible, but if that's happening, there's probably global growth. In other words, the emerging markets are rising. The dollar is yep. getting weaker. Maybe they're doing QE. And in that scenario, the rest of the world's growing. The U.S. is growing, but the rest of the world's growing even more. In that scenario, I think Philip Morris goes up. So I don't think there's a scenario where the rest of the world goes up and the U.S. goes down. So under a worst case scenario, I, I think you're better off in the U.S. than you are anywhere else. Uh, again, it doesn't mean the U.S. is the greatest place in the world. It doesn't mean we have all the answers. It doesn't mean we haven't made any mistakes. I just think for what's coming down the pike over the next couple of years, we were the best relative place to be. Grant, thank you very much. This has been a fascinating discussion. Is there any final message you want to leave to our listeners or something we haven't touched upon? You know, I think the only thing I would say is the, you know, it's probably now it's it's more important now to to just be prepared for anything. You know, don't necessarily listen to what I have to say and take it all as gospel. <laughs> you know, you know, I, I would encourage you to consider what I say, but I think you should listen to a number of other people as well. Listen to a number of different ideas and then kind of make up your mind for yourself. But but what I would say is, you know, don't be certain of anything. Certainty is a killer. Um I think it's a good idea to have some cash on the sidelines because you just never know what's going to happen. You know, I think it's a good idea to have some gold because you just never know what's going to happen. Um, I think it's a good idea to have some equities because, you know, inflationary pressures are here and that's one of the better ways to keep up with inflation. But it doesn't mean you should go put all your money in the stock market either. I think diversification is really important. Um, and I think, uh, you know, keeping an open mind on what could happen um, is probably the most important thing of all. Thank you very much, Brent. I really appreciate it, and I hope we can do this the next time. Thanks for having me. Espero que tenham aproveitado essa conversa com o Brent Johnson. Compartilhem, acompanhem ele também no Twitter. E se vocês gostarem do conteúdo, clique aqui no botão de gostei, porque isso ajuda o YouTube a distribuir este conteúdo. Obrigado e até a próxima conversa.